Well, welcome to our friends, and we are live again. I just held the button down a little longer, and the Lord answered our prayer. So, we are in John chapter 15, which is all about, I'm the true vine, and you are the branches. My father is a vine dresser, and sometimes he prunes us, sometimes he leads us and guides us in a way that makes sense out of the trials that we're facing. Um, I've had trials this week. Anybody raise your hand if you had trials this week? Anything that's been difficult for you? Okay, I'm not the only one. So that's so good to know that I'm not alone. And what we'll notice that in this whole passage, Jesus is talking to the disciples, very intimate, last few hours of his life, and he wants them to know something. He wants them to know that if you want to have joy, if you want to have a fruitful life, if you want to be able to have the abundance that I promised for you, I need you to remain in me. I need you to remain connected to me. You know, some of you have, raise your hand if you have some tomato plants that are growing right now. Uh, maybe you have a tree, the apple tree, pear tree, peach tree, something that's either down in the street from your house. We have hedge apple trees that are shedding their head, hedge apples right now. But if you notice, the trees that are producing fruit look pretty healthy. And the trees that this spring looked kind of dead, they produced no fruit whatsoever because either they're dead at the root or some of those branches are diseased or maybe the branches are broken and, and that tree just wasn't ever pruned. Well, as we look at this chapter, Jesus is giving a spiritual truth and an analogy in a way that um, he's making it clear that trusting in me is like a branch that is, is grafted into a tree or is connected to the source of nourishment. And we think about husbandmen. What is a husbandman? A husbandman is like a gardener, and that's the very first job that was ever given to a human being. Adam was called to be the husbandman or the vine dresser of the Garden of Eden. And so as we look at chapter 15 and we pray, um, I hope that this chapter does a work in me and in you that we trust him more deeply and that the fruit of our lives continues to, as the psalmist says, the older trees are like, or older people become righteous as they go older are like cedars and they're filled with sap and they produce fruit in their old age. And I think the older we get, the more mature we get, the more fruitful we can be, even in the last, last few months, years, weeks. And come what may, the rapture could be right around the corner. It could be another 10, 15 years. We don't know. But I want us all to be fruitful. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've sent Jesus to be the true, the true vine. And Lord, that we can trust in him, remain steadfast and, and able to put our full confidence in him. Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts tonight through your powerful word that we may grow stronger and more fruitful and, and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus says here, I am the true vine. And my father is a vine dresser. So Jesus is the source of your fruitfulness. And God, the father, is looking out for your fruitfulness. God wants the best for you. One of the greatest lies from the garden of Eden was, the, did God really say that you can't eat from every tree in the, in the garden? And here we see that Jesus is saying, I'm the vine my father's a vine dresser and every branch in me, every person that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to be plucked or pruned. As James says in chapter one, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you're faced with various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce perseverance, but let that complete its work so that you may be perfect and lacking nothing in your faith. So the trials and the temptations are one thing, but the, the correction of our great God. Our Hebrews says no discipline or pruning is pleasant when you're going through it, but it's fruitful, it's helpful. So when you prune a plant, have you ever done some arbor work where you trim the tree branches because, um, and I'll just talk about my own experience, but if there's one branch that has several branches coming off, typically you want to go with uh, the branch that's the strongest, most 
healthy and cut off the smaller branches that are either going straight downward or straight upward so that the tree can take its natural form. Well, think about, if, you have, if you've ever been down near Mulvane and I-35, you see the, we don't have a lot of vineyards in Kansas, but you can see the, the winery, a windswept winery maybe. But you see how an orchard, um, you have a vineyard, orchards are the apples and pear trees and those fruit trees. If you go to Israel today, there's orchards and orchards of, of orange, tangerines, lemons, and limes everywhere along the Sea of Galilee. And they're just so symmetrical how they planted all the trees and they put mosquito nets over all of them in large numbers so they keep them. I mean, it's just abundant. They have banana trees everywhere too. But the pruning process, when you see a branch that's overcrowded, and it's not, it's not going to have room to grow. And, and you have to, it almost seems like a branch has to be pruned um, where there's several inches around it all the way up to the edge. Because when the leaves come out and the flowers are produced, the flowers become then later the fruit. And if they don't have several inches to expand, then it'll suffocate. And a tree, in a sense, if it's not pruned um, and not part away, you're, you're only going to have a, a small, small harvest. Now, let me get back to the simplicity of it. You don't want a branch that has 15 branches off of it in a small area. You want to focus on the bis biggest branch and maybe one or two offshoots because you want it to um, occupy the space. And think about it. If you have a dead branch, if you don't cut it off or it's just taking up room, right? God's point here, Jesus, is very clear. If you're not bearing fruit, eventually that's the whole purpose of life, is to bear fruit, be fruitful. So how do you do that? Well, he goes on to say in, in verse 3, you're already clean. Remember Peter says, baptize me, like chapter 13. Well, wash my whole body, my head, everything. He's like, no, you're already clean, Peter, because of the word I spoke to you. Um, and think about that. It's God's word that makes us clean as we obey it. But then in verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. He says, As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus is saying, I am the source, but the key is abiding in the vine. He's the vine, we're a branch. The branch doesn't support the vine. The vine supports the branch. If you cut off the branch, what happens? So uh, Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel, he took some kids out to youth camp. And he, took, he, cut, he lopped off a branch on an apple tree at the first day of camp. And he throws it down on the ground in front of the kids. And for three, four, five days, they're up in the mountains. They're having youth camp. And every day they pass by that branch. Guess what happens every day? It gets more and more dead looking, right? And so at the end of the five days, he says, look, the whole point of camp today and this week is for you to realize. The illustration is this. If you don't stay connected to Christ, you're going to be like this branch. Nothing's ever going to be produced. Now, if you quickly take that branch that you just cut down and you plant it and you fertilize it, that's a different story. But he says, you have to abide in the vine if you want to produce fruit. And he says, neither can you abide in me if you want to produce fruit. Unless you, you abide in Christ, you can't produce fruit. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Another, another version says, apart from me you can do nothing. John 15, 5, very easy to remember, but think about that. What are you trying to do in your life right now? You know, when you're, if it's finances, if it's reaching out to your neighbors, if it's earning uh, a good reputation so that you're, you can have more opportunity somewhere. And some young people, it's like, they're working so hard to build their career, or they're working so hard to save up their money, or they're working so hard to start um, accomplishing, checking the boxes. But Jesus says, apart from me, you can't do anything. So what do you measure success by? And in Jesus' book, he says, he goes on to talk about joy. If you want to have success uh, and fruitfulness, he talks about bearing much fruit. 
I want this in my life. You guys want that in your life? Bearing much fruit? I have a bushel of apples I bought from Yoder, and we bought it like two or three weeks ago. I still have like 25 apples left. Like fruit is a great thing, and it nourishes us. And when it's actually healthy and, or when it's ripe, it's not something that's been in a refrigerator for six months before you eat it. It's quite tasty. Now, we have a, a watermelon that's been in our fridge for two months downstairs. I don't know if it's any good. It's not moldy or anything. We just haven't cut it. But these apples are fresh. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. What are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? It starts with love. So someone who remains in Christ will have love. We'll see that. And joy and peace. And patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness. Then gentleness and self-control. Those things will be greatly added to your life when you do what? Abide in Christ. He's the vine, we're the branches, we abide in Him, we have much fruit. Without Him, we got nothing. If you walk a few hours or a day or two or three or a week or two or a month or two or a year or two without acknowledging Christ, praying to Jesus, listening to His words, obeying His word, you're not going to have a fruitful life. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, just like I talked about that illustration. You cut a branch off, you lay it on the ground long enough, it shrivels up, right? Dries up. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw into the fire, and they are burned. Notice the red letters I emphasize here. God will gather the righteous and the wicked in the last day, like at the last judgment, when he creates the new heavens and the new earth. And those who he does not know, who reject him, who are not fruitful, who do not obey his word, don't honor him, don't trust him, they're not going to have any good fruit. They're going to be gathered up, thrown into the fire and burned. If any, it says, if you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. The key here, abide in me, ask, it shall be done for you. It's his word that we meditate on. It helps us understand what we should be asking for. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew on the, sermon of the, on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, they will know that you're uh, my fathers, your sons of the Father, when you're peacemakers. They'll call you children of God. Um, when people see that you're a peacemaker, when people see your good works, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. And you don't do them for yourself. You don't do them for vain glory or pride. You just... Hopefully, you're playing that Christian Spotify playlist at the end of your workout because you want to honor God and you know it's going to bless Him and other people. What blesses you blesses others. You're not doing it other than to glorify God. And what happens there is when you're bearing that fruit, the Father's glorified. And people can see this is something that's, that's naturally living in your life. It's coming out. You just can't help but. I love that fruit is alive, whereas works are dead. But fruit, something that's motivated by um, a greater source, it's from a nourishment from the vine, in that spiritual sense. Good works should flow out of a heart that's been changed. Fruit comes out of a vine. And people will distinguish, okay, that's a true disciple. Why? Because I can tell by what they do that it's coming from a good, good source. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. Now, here's the key. Just as much as God loves Jesus, Jesus says, I'm crazy about you all. I love you so much. I haven't, I haven't even withheld my own self. And he's about to die on the cross for our sins right after he says this. But he says, here's the key. Just as he says, abide in my love, Jude reemphasizes this. He says, I wanted to write you about our common salvation, but he says, but... I need you to contend earnestly for the faith, once and for all, delivered to the saints. But then he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Why is that such an emphasis? If you don't abide in the love of Jesus Christ, you will abide in all sorts of contention and pride and envy and strife and anger and selfishness, selfish ambition. 
Look at the last days. Paul tells Timothy, in the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, disobedient to parents, boastful, arrogant, headstrong, right? But he says, just abide in my love. If you abide in the love of Christ, then that kind of guides everything else. Has anybody ever uh, tried to, I don't know, push a wheelbarrow from the front? You, you kind of got to balance the wheelbarrow and it's, it's what handles are on the back. You shouldn't be pushing it from the front, right? Or have you ever tried to uh, steer a wagon by pushing the wagon rather than pulling the wagon? Have you ever tried to do that with a radio flyer wagon? So when the love of God constrains you and the love of God is pulling you, it sets your way straight. It's, it shouldn't be a battle where God's trying to push you and steer you and you, you're like fighting him all along the way. When you're trying to push a wagon, it's, it goes cockeyed and it fishtails, right? But if you just let the spirit and the love of God remaining in him guide your life, he'll direct your path. But he says, the father loved me. I'm crazy about you. I love you. So you got to abide in that, stay in that. Are there tough days where you're like, you know what? I don't even love me. <laughs> I don't, I've messed up. And I don't even love, I hate what I've done. I don't like this. Or I just, I'm, I'm, I'm disgruntled. I want to be gruntled, but I'm disgruntled. <laughs> Whatever that means, gruntled. But you're just kind of, I don't feel loved. I feel isolated. I feel frustrated. And Jesus says, abide in my love. You got you to gotta come back to it. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. That's how you do it, though. You've got to keep coming back to the Word of God, loving God supremely, loving your neighbor, treasuring His Word, His promises. He says, you will abide in my love if you keep my commandments, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. You guys have any pet peeves? You know what a pet peeve is? You know, it's that thing that kind of grates against you and you're like, ah, oh. One of mine, I, I probably haven't shared it with my loved ones, but it's like it takes three seconds or ten seconds to wind up the, the uh, vacuum cleaner cord. And I've never minded doing that ever in my life. But it's just hard for some people to wind up the cord. But that's my, well, another person's pet peeve might be not putting the soap on the counter and putting it under the sink or something like whatever. However you... But I say all that to say, like, there are some things that Jesus and the, the Word of God, Father, who created us, make very clear. And you just got to do it, right? And it, it's not like, it's a, not a pet peeve of God that you should love your neighbor and that you should forgive your enemies and that you should, you know, seek peace and pursue it and try to live a quiet, peaceable life. And these are not his pet peeves, but he knows and he commands us and honor your mother and father and, and you know, pray for dignitaries and they're not as pet peeves but it's just much better for us if we just do them just there's one in the new testament that says flee sexual immorality for this is the will of god like how do i know the will of god well it's right there he just said it so you've got to be pure i mean well, well i don't like that well he's not trying to punish you i mean how miserable are people who disobey and all you have to do is obey so if you keep my commandments, it's like your kids. If you just simply just wash the dishes, then you can go play. If you just do, do the dishes, if you just obey what I said, then you can do what you want to do. I know what I know. It. Okay, well, then you can't play. <laughs> He's saying, just obey my commandments, and that's how you'll experience my love. Just as I, Jesus, was a perfect son, and he obeyed his father's commandments. He didn't fight. God, he said, well, if, it's, if there's any other way, but he didn't say, this isn't fair. And God didn't say, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. He didn't say that. He didn't have to do that. He just said, no, this is, the, this is the way. And Jesus said, okay, not my will, but your will be done. So simply, how do I prove that I'm remaining in the love of God? I just need to do what he says. Psalm 119, I'll be reading through that soon with you all in the mornings, but says, how can a young man keep his way pure but to, to treasure his word in his heart and do according to his word? To, Lord, how can I keep my, my way pure but to meditate? He says, I, I, um, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. 
So you got you to know what His commandments are, and then you do it, and then that proves that you love Him. God wrote us a big love letter. It's called the Bible. <laughs> I know it's more complicated than that, but it's simply, it's a big love letter of commandments that are to help us. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now I listened to Johnny Cash reading the New King James Version of this chapter over and over and over. And he put emphasis on the word my joy. <laughs> my joy. It didn't really help me meditate on it as much as I thought it would, but it's interesting. Every time you read the scriptures, you can put emphasis on, on one or two key words. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. The joy of the Lord is our strength, as Ezra told the, the people of Judah when they came back to rebuild Jerusalem. He said, don't cry. I know you're sad about a lot of things. Like Jerusalem's not like it was under Solomon, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. Today's a day to rejoice. And whose joy? The joy of the Lord, my joy, Jesus' joy. He says, I'm telling you all this so that my joy can be in your heart and that your joy may be full or overflowing. I have dogs and we go for a run every morning. My wife runs more like three miles every day for the last however many days there have been this year. She's run three miles a day. And I run about a mile. So I can't keep up. But I come back in and guess who's ready to get their water and their food, right? We've got two big dogs, right? She, she runs the doodle, I run the, the gold door. And you have to watch them, but the, you can't give them enough food. Like they wish you would overflow their bowl and the water and the food are scarfed up as quickly as you put, but we pray and they know that they can't eat until we pray. But I tell you what, We've had dogs before where you're filling their bowl and, and if you keep filling it, they'll eat because previous owners, they were traumatized where they never knew when their next meal was going to be. So they would eat and eat and eat and eat. Well, Jesus is saying better than that. What, I, what I'm giving you is going to make you full. <laughs> Your joy may be full, complete. And Ephesians 5, I believe it's 18, it says... Uh, but be being filled with the Spirit. And there's this principle of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing process. This Ephesians 5. Um, 18, I believe. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So he says, don't be drunk with wine. A lot of people get drunk in these days. Look at COVID. I mean, a lot of people, the liquor stores were busy. They were. Look in the tribulation. People will use more and more drugs. But we are not to be drunk with wine, we're to be filled with the Spirit. And in the word be filled means be being filled. And what Jesus is saying, I want your joy to be being filled to the brim. And he said in John 10, 10, I came that you may have life and life more abundant. But I love that about our Savior. He's not Muhammad. He's not Siddhartha Gautama that, you know, that we don't exist. He's not Muhammad who's like, you must submit to Allah. He's not this Confucius says, you know, philosopher. He's not some false teacher. He's the God of the universe who he became man, died on the cross, rose from the grave. And he said, guess what? I'm telling you all this because I want you to have a joyful life. The other religions of the world, they're not a relationship. And we're going to see. He doesn't call us servants. He said, this is my commandment. Very, very simple. That you love one another as I have loved you. Remember, he wants us to have a very joyful life. That's why he's talking to us this way. Very, it's kind of a mystery how he's talking, but he says, you know, I want you to have a joyful life. So what's the key? This is my commandment. You love one another as I have loved you. What is the key to joy? 
obeying God's commands. What is the crux of God's commands? Loving your neighbor. Loving God and loving your neighbor. That's it. How many trainings could be summed up to love your neighbor? Now, aeronautical trainings, you know, corrections, um, banking, nursing, teaching. I mean, there's all sorts of specialties, but if you boil down the key themes to all those trainings, it's conscientiousness or loving respect toward what service you're providing, who you're providing the service to, and being thoughtful in how you do it. Well, who's the source of that? The commandment to love one another as God has loved us. That's the standard. And the gold standard, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a, a Christ-like principle that the world did not ever come up with. It's an impossible standard unless you're remaining in the Spirit and remaining in Christ. Now, this is one of our weekend verses for this upcoming Sunday, but greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. How do I prove that I love? Just make your life about other people and loving them and have a balance. You, you got to sleep sometime. You got to work and eat sometime. But other than, you know, some of you are retired, don't have to work, but your work is unto the Lord because you're free and you, that's great. But you're still managing and stewarding resources either way, no matter where you're at in life. But this is the greatest love that you could do. Lay down your life for your friends. Lay down your life for your friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. How do you know someone's a believer? If they are doing loving things. Well, they say they love me, but then when they're not around, they gossip about me. That's not uh, someone who's a, a friend of God that's going to be... I mean, they may be a friend of God who's walking in the flesh. So... How do you know, how did Jesus know he, we were his friends? He says to the disciples, do whatever I command you. The last command that he gave to the disciples before he went to heaven, before we have revelation, which are some letters from him, he said, go and make disciples. So that's the key. Go out, reach out to people and love them like as I've, I've loved you, love one another, okay? So... But notice, James hits on this. You've got to be a doers of the word, not hearers only. You're my friends if you do what I command you. You've got to do it. Just do it. No longer do I call you servants. Now, this is where he kind of changes the relationship. It's not a religion. It's not a duty. We're not slaves or servants in the sense of like we only are like peasants, like groveling. Oh, Lord, would you please? He is our Lord. We are his servants. True. But he says, I don't just call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. Like, he doesn't know the secrets of the master because some of those closed door meetings, the servants were left out, right? The servants don't need to know the king or the master what he's wanting to do. But he says, I've called you friends. This is revolutionary. The God of the universe and Jesus calls us friends. We've sung songs about this. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you would love me, and we sing that I'm a friend of God, right? He says, I've called you friends for all the things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus in his humanity, he became an infant. He grew as a man in stature and wisdom and favor with God and man as Luke recounts to us in chapter 2. But he says, in my visiting you, in me living this life and becoming one of you, I have made known everything that I've heard from my Father in this capacity. Now, Jesus, at this time, it's at the Father's appointed time before the rapture occurs, but He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He has such glory we can't comprehend right now. But He's saying, everything that I heard from my Father I made known to you. I held nothing back. Paul would later tell the church as he was traveling to Jerusalem, I think he talked to the Ephesian elders, and he said, I have not shunned from declaring the whole counsel of God to you. He's like, I held nothing back. Jesus is saying, I've hold, I'm holding nothing back to you because you're my friends. Paul considered the churches that he planted his friends.
But if you want to find that reference in the book of Acts, it says, none of these things move me, Paul says, but he's, he's ready to die because he's called to go to Rome. Uh, but he told the Ephesians leaders, I've not failed to, I've, I've, heard, I've heard the word of God, I've not failed to declare the whole counsel. Jesus is saying, whatever the Father made known to me, I've made it known to you. There's no, no secrets I held back. Now this is about kind of providence and choosing. I, I don't get into debates with people about you know, Arminianism or Calvinism and some people predestination, all that. But it's interesting, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. God's will is for us to be fruitful. And a lot of us want to take credit. Well, I chose God. I found Jesus. Well, he really, he knew about you before you ever knew about him. But he says, and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So if you're ever struggling and you, you get to that point where you're like, I, I don't feel that God loves me. Well, if you trust in Jesus Christ and you're lacking that joy, just know that before the heavens were created and the earth was created, he knew. As, as Psalm 139 says, David says, you hemmed me in behind and before you knit me together in my mother's womb. You saw me afar off. He says, these things are too wonderful for me to comprehend. Jesus tells the, the disciples, the 11 of them left, because remember Judas ate the bread and he left to go betray Jesus. He's talking to the 11 disciples and he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I'm going to, he chose Thomas, Bartholomew, you know, he, he chose James and John and Judah, Judas, um, not Iscariot, but the other Judas and, and Matthew, the tax collector. He chose Philip, he chose these guys because he said, I've got, I'm appointing you to go and bear fruit. Now, everybody who listened to their message, they were appointed to go bear fruit and the, just the cycle continues, this fruitfulness. Um, he said, I want your fruit to remain. These disciples, all 11 of them, all the apostles, I should say, all 11 of them died for Christ, with exception to John, who was, he was exiled to Patmos after he, they tried to boil him alive and he was exiled to Patmos. So that he died like close to 100 years old. But he says, I want you to bear fruit and that your fruit would remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Thomas was killed in India. Peter was killed head down. Some people think that means upside down. It could have just meant that he kept his head down. We don't know. Um, James was beheaded. I think it was James, the brother of Jesus. Tom, uh, Stephen was stoned. He was the first martyr ever in the church. I think Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8. These people, in their dying breath, they forgave the people that were killing them. So that's pretty fruitful when you can love the people that are killing you. I mean, how do you get mad at that? And so it haunted Saul, who carried all the coats of the people who stoned Stephen to death, that he consented to the death of Stephen, and he had to live with that the rest of his life. So that's pretty fruitful. All 11 of these guys, 10 out of the 11, were martyred. And they died gracefully saying, Lord, forgive them. Just like Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do when he died on the cross. So, and their fruit has remained because they testified. And we don't hear all the details of every one of the disciples, but Peter wrote the gospel, gospel of Mark through John Mark. Matthew wrote the gospel of Matthew. Uh, John, the beloved disciple, wrote this gospel. And then Luke was a physician that many people think wrote the gospel according to Paul, basically. But Luke was a Macedonian physician. And all these people that were impacted because of the fruitfulness of these men remaining true or loyal or remaining in the teachings of Jesus, and which produced joy, not happiness, not worldly success, but joy that then propelled them through persecutions, which propelled them to their deaths, which were sacrificial, like fertilizer for the church. That led to more fruitfulness. And he says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, in my authority, Jesus' authority, he may give you. So my prayer life changed, and maybe yours has, more and more as you grow with Christ, because you know what authority you're praying by. 
It's not, a, well, I sure hope God hears me. No, He hears us. But not on my authority, but on the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, on the authority of Jesus. I don't have to pray to a priest. I don't have to pray to a dead saint who's just on the same level playing field as all of us. I, I don't trust in something that I, that I hope on a wing and a prayer. I trust in Jesus who said, when you pray by my name, you're talking directly to the Father. I have entrance to this throne of grace by what Jesus did for me. I can enter into the Holy of Holies because when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. So he says, when you pray in my name to the Father, he's going to give you what you pray for. We looked at that last week. <laughs> this is really big here, but these things I command you. This is not an option. He says, you got, you, got to, you got to bear some fruit and I called you my friends and you need to do what I told you. And he goes on to say, I command you that you love one another. He reiterates in verse 17 what he told them in verse 12. If he repeats himself, it's pretty important. Love one another. Love one another. Love is not always financial. Love is not always physical. Love is not always verbal. Love is sometimes doing what's best for someone in tough love. Have you ever heard of tough love? <laughs> sometimes we have to confront and sometimes we have to hold accountable and sometimes we have to do those difficult things that you don't want to do when you love someone. Sometimes love means when your parents get older, it's taking care of their illnesses or, or, you know, walking them through that. And sometimes it's, you know, forgiving something that you don't want to forgive, but you have to. Or else you're not going to have the joy, right? So he reminds them and he says, if the world hates you. Now this is kind of talking about persecution and some comfort for us. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before you. I can almost hear the growls sometimes when I share that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ in the prisons. You know, I can, I can sense sometimes, and it's, you're not persecuted because you're weird. Now, don't be a weird Christian, okay? Meaning obnoxious and rude. You don't want to be obnoxious or rude. But if you're respectful, you're di dignified, whimsical, like, hey, I believe in Jesus. He's changed my life. I think he could help you. You know, if, you're, if you have that kind of stance, it's kind of hard to get mad at that. But if someone that wants to attack you for that, he said, hey, if they attack you, just remember, I'm perfect and they hated me. <laughs> okay? Like he's literally God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, and they hate, hated him. Who did? Who hated Jesus the most? Let's think about this. The religious people. The powerful rulers and leaders of the day. It's very bizarre, but understandable if you read these words we just read. It hated me before you. Who? The world. The elites in Davos, Switzerland, and the World Economic Forum, and the elites that are trying to move that movement, the elites of the United Nations, the elites of this global movement for a global economy that want to destroy the United States of America and want to destroy Christians and every nation, see Christians as a threat. Why? Because our gospel preaches liberty. And what do they want? Oppression and power for a select few. Understood? So Jesus says, I came that you may have life and liberty. And he gave that to women and men and young and old and poor and rich and slave and free. And the, the evil powers of this age, the rulers of this age, that Satan has allowed to, you know, he's, they're doing Satan's work in this age. They hate born-again believers. But I'll tell you what, believers die well. You know why? Because this isn't our home. I chipped my tooth the other day. You can't really tell. I told my wife, I was like, I was just trying to get some lifesavers out of it. She's like, don't use your teeth to get lifesavers out of the package. I'm like, I don't know. You can't tell that I have a chipped tooth, but I'm like, man, and guess what? It's not my permanent body. I can't take it with me anyway. But my point is, I'm just homesick all the more. Whenever something chips away from your body or from your car or from your house, you're like, I can't, I'm just managing it and I try to manage it well and I try to take good care of the things that I'm taking care of. But at the end of the day, the older we get, the longer, more days we exist, the longer we see, 
I tell you what, I took my car to the shop and they forgot to put my undercarriage protector on and it like dragged against my tires and they still won't you know, reimburse me for the repairs. You know what, it's just a car and I will deal with that. But it's like, it's got so many scuffs all over my car. Like it's almost like you gotta put a sign up that says do not, it's not abandoned, right? You know, that's kind of good because people won't want to steal it maybe. But the idea is you're just passing through. And the world that thinks, that makes you think you don't have enough, you need that nice shiny thing that everybody else wants to have. Guess what? Your house is just fine. Your body is what God wants you to have right now. Your relationships are a blessing and He can bless you even more with the ones you already have. Frankly, that the world hates you because contentment is so anti-world. <laughs> Thankfulness is so anti-world. The world makes a profit off of your unthankfulness, your discontentment. And the world to come makes profit by us caring and loving one another. Does that make sense? We get to win people into the kingdom. We get to grow in what we're going to be doing forever, which is loving God, loving each other forever. And he says, remember, they hated me, so they're going to hate you. You're going to get that flack. But guess what you get to say? Don't shoot the messenger. I mean, you can, but I'm just saying this is what I was told and I believe it because Jesus said it. So if you're mad at somebody, be mad at him and you can take it out on me, okay. But you know what? You lose everything. The world hasn't taken your soul. Why? Because you've remained in Christ and you haven't lost a thing. You've gained eternity with Christ. James Elliot, Jim Elliot famous missionary who went to Wheaton College. Elizabeth Elliot, she wrote Through the Gates of Splendor, a lot of devotionals. She was the widow of Jim, Jim Elliot. He went to reach the Alca Indians. He ministered in Mexico for a while, learned the Spanish language, and then they went to Ecuador, and they went to a primitive group called the Alcas. I believe I'm maybe saying that wrong. But in the story, he and Steve Saint and a few other missionaries, they go, I get goosebumps, I, it's just real, anyway. Jim had a, a little daughter. But I've read his journals. And he's very famous for one phrase, and that phrase is this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now think about that. He is no fool who gives up temporary pleasures of this world to gain what you can never lose, which is the souls and the salvation and the hope for people. Now, these men were killed, four of them, when flying an airplane and circling and trying to make contact with this people group. But those people group, and I get goosebumps, I've seen the movie, there's The End of the Spear. If you guys want to watch the movie, it's probably on YouTube, but The End of the Spear, The End of the Spear. They watched Jim and Steve and these men, what they called cross the boa. They saw the angel, they heard the angels singing and they saw these men going to glory after they murdered them with spears and killed them. And later, one of the sisters or cousins of those missionaries, she went to those tribes and they found the person that helped them translate and they won that tribe, many of them to Christ. And they're still ministering. Steve Saint's son is there, like has been there. You just watch the movie, read the stories. Like Missionary Aviation Fellowship, if you ever heard of MAF, that's, that was one of their, their outreaches to reach that unreached group. But think about it. He knew I could lose my life. He was a top class wrestler at Wheaton and in high school. And he's like, missionaries need to be fit. They need to be strong. It's going to be tough times. But he, he's writing when he's doing his missions work. I feel so blessed. He's like helping a whole town build a runway and, and buildings. And he's like, I'm employing 50 or 100 people. They never taught me how to do this at Wheaton Bible College. Like, I have joy inexpressible. He's like, I think it's almost wrong for me to feel so joyful because he was just following the Lord and doing what God had called him to do as a missionary. And it's often that when we just surrender to the Lord, he has a way to give us joy that nothing else compares to. But 
the primitive men who didn't understand, they killed him and he lost, lost they sent him back home in cardboard boxes and they left widows. And Elizabeth Elliot does not mince words when she says that was very difficult and not a, not a great way to go. And there was a lot of cost to pay with that. But when these disciples, the 11 that followed Jesus, ended up every, costing them everything to follow him, in this world standards, they faced that hatred with perfect love, just like Jesus, in the sense of like, it's worth it. They hated him, they, did, they killed him, they're gonna kill me. Now on the flip side, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. You know, you, you wanna not have any persecution, just be like the world. Dress like them, drive like them, talk like them, think like them. But he says, yet you disciples, apostles, because you're not of the world, because, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world to be holy and set apart, to come out of the world, to come out of Babylon, to come out of Egypt, to come out of the wicked idolatry. Worshiping things that won't even matter. Like, think about it. Is what I'm doing going to matter a thousand years from now? If it does, if it passes that test, then do it. Keep doing it. Like, is it going to be helpful for eternity for a thousand years from now? Well, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world's living for today. Carpe diem sees the day. You are living for eternity. We have a dear friend. Uh, we don't get to talk very often, but... He was a youth pastor here briefly after my wife and I got married. But the one thing he said is keep an eternal perspective, make eternal decisions or keep an eternal perspective. Always make kingdom choices or eternal perspective decisions. It's, think about it, Joey, you're, you're about to set the course of, you know, my career, where I'm going to live, who I'm going to marry, whoever that may be. You have a chance to set your eternity on a good track by saying, I will not compromise on who I choose to spend the rest of my life with. And many of us have made that choice now and we don't regret it. All of us, I could say, probably attest to all of us in this room have made that choice and we are grateful to have a believer. That's what you get to choose. And what he's saying to them is like, the world just, they'll hate you if you're not like them because they're miserable because they're just focused on temporary, but you're focused on coming out of the world because you're focused on me because I'm not from this world and I'm preparing a place for you, like he said last chapter. And so that where I am, you can come too. And in my father's house are many mansions. And if it weren't so, I would have told you. So I'm telling you, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So come my way. And if you come my way, guess what? The world's going to hate you. Who cares? You're not here for the world. You're here for the world to come. You're here for the kingdom. You're here for the king. And you want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Remember, the world... Sorry, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. You know, he said, you're my friends, but a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But on the flip side, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Like my friend Sarah in college, early in college said, as long as you love Jesus, it's all good. We, we, can, we can deal. That's all that matters. So he's saying, if they love Jesus, you're going to have no problems with them. You're going to have peace. They keep his word. I could, I could go to any church anywhere in the world and feel at home because they love Jesus. They keep his word. I keep his word. I want to do that. Even transcending language, even transcending culture, even transcending technology, you can walk in any Christ-believing, born-again church in the world and if they keep God's word, they're going to keep yours. Now the apostles, they planted churches in India, Asia, Europe, Africa, and every culture was transformed for the better. Rights were given to women, right? There were, uh, dignity was shown to all people groups because the church and the message of the master was transformative. He said, I come to give you life. I live, you also will live. He says, Forgive your enemies. He says, um, do good to those who persecute you. He says, don't 
worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about more than you know what you are to eat, what you are to drink, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Those teachings help transcend because here I am living for loving God and loving people. And you just can't oppress in, a, in that gospel. There's no oppression in the gospel. The blessing of the Lord makes one wise and he adds no sorrow with it. There's a proverb that says that. Where these apostles went with the gospel and people heard them, the blessing of the Lord was there and there was no sorrow with it. Where the gospel has transformed cities, cities, counties, countries, and civilizations, there has not been sorrow with the gospel. The only sorrow is from people who were really not living the commandments of Christ. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. The people who persecuted James and John and Paul and Thomas and so on and so forth, Stephen, they did it on account of the testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus rose from the grave, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is coming back, that Jesus is the Lord of glory, Jesus is the revealer of secrets, Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is our all in all, and they kept saying this, and they kept proving it, they kept demonstrating it, they kept declaring it, they kept preaching it, they kept sharing it, they kept discipling people, and at some point, they had had enough, and the persecutors would kill them. Because they stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it anymore. But he says, this is for my name's sake. This glorified God. And it's because they really don't know God. The only person who would persecute is someone who doesn't know him. So you're either a sheep or a goat. You're either lost or saved. You're either in the kingdom of darkness or kingdom of light. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for the sins. The Pharisees that got to hear Jesus preach and teach and do the miracles, he said... If I hadn't talked to them, then okay, well, that's not fair. But here I am, I'm talking, preaching, living this perfect life right before their eyes, healing people, raising the dead, and they're going to want to kill me and you? He who hates me hates my father also. There's no love of the father when they hated Jesus. So the religious zealots like Paul, now Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, we'll read, were converted and born again Pharisees. Later in Acts chapter 3, we see many Jews, 3,000 to be exact, come to know Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2. But he says, if you hate me, you hate my father. That's pretty bold. You can't say you love God and hate Jesus at the same time. Well, I don't like that Jesus taught this. Well, you don't like Jesus? You don't love Jesus? You think he's a liar? you think he's a false prophet, then you hate the Father. You hate the God who created the heavens and the earth. Jesus says, you can't have it both ways. Well, I believe there's a lot of different ways to heaven. Well, that's not what Jesus said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Jesus says, if they hate me, they hate the Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they've seen and they've hated both me and my father. He's saying, it's getting high time. I'm about to be crucified, guys. And they've seen every good work that I've done and they still want to kill me. You know, they, they aren't going to get away with this. But that the word might be fulfilled, which was written, they hated me without a cause. Now, I've listened to this chapter time and time and time again. This prophecy, they hated me without a a cause. It's from Psalm 35, 19. Um, I think it's also Psalm 109, 3 through 5. And you look at this Psalm 69, 4. We have these different cross references where the psalmist is saying, why, why do they hate me? You know, so many times David is declaring, like, Lord, why do my enemies, why do they have it out for me? David's like, I was so loyal. I was so good to them. And what did they give me in return? They just stabbed me in the back. You ever, you ever been betrayed by a dear friend? You kind of, you feel the sting of that. You may think, well, this, this just isn't right. In Psalm 35, 19, it says, Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let, let them wink the eye who hate me without a cause. 
I mean, if you just declare the name of Jesus, it's amazing how many people will just instantly not like you. Have you experienced, am I, you guys experienced that a little bit? Have you had somebody like totally turned off to you because oh, how dare you bring up Jesus? I mean, you can talk about God all you want, but Jesus? Psalm 69, 4, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing. I still must restore it. You know, there's people that take advantage of you and will exploit you. Why? Because you call on the name of the true God and you believe in Jesus. Does that mean you just turn the other cheek? Well, Jesus said to, but does that mean that you never stand up for yourself? No. But does it mean that sometimes you take the disgrace of Christ and you try to reach that person? There's been many spouses who have taken disgrace from their spouse in hopes to win them to the Lord. Even to the point of, of physical violence and that kind of thing, which is horrible. I, I mean, that's... we have. Yeah, there has to be a line where I would never advise someone to be in harm's way in that way. But there have been spouses that have been hated without a cause for years and years. But then somehow, some way, Peter says that they would be won by the conduct of their, of their wife or their husband. You know, you married an unbeliever. Um, you're in an unequally yoked relationship and that person doesn't believe in Jesus. Well, you're not going to win them necessarily by harping on them and complaining, but you might be able to win them by doing what Jesus says here. Now, they're going to hate you without a cause, but remain in me. Obey my commandments. Love your neighbors yourself. Love, love as I have loved you. There's one other passage. We'll look at Psalm 109, verse 3 through 5, and then we'll kind of come to a close here in the next couple verses. Psalm 109, verse 3 through 5. It says, They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. And the psalmist here, this is a psalm of David, and he's saying, you know, I've just shown them love and they're accusing me. They, they hate me. Jesus said, remember, they hated me before they hated you. This is fulfilling all of those words. We just read three different Psalms and Jesus is saying, this is what I'm talking about. But when the helper comes, who's the capital H helper? When the Holy Spirit, the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he, notice the Holy Spirit's called a he by Jesus, whatever, you may think, I may have said it many times when I'm referring to the Holy Spirit, but it's a he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit never testifies of itself. We don't say, oh, we praise you, O Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always testifying of Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants us to praise Jesus, the King of glory, who then wants us to honor the Father. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we praise the Father and the Son. But yes, they are three in one. So he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and in other Gospels, he puts it this way. Don't premeditate what you're going to say, but when I call you before the councils and the, the priests and the rulers, then I will give you the words. So the Holy Spirit had a way of putting the right words in the mouths of his people. The Spirit of truth. They're going to speak forth the truth that proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. So in tangible terms, Jesus is literally, we're talking like real terms, like if this was a crime scene, this forensic analysis or whatnot. Let's say it's like 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. It's 5 p.m. at the Passover dinner table. The apostles have now had this conversation with Jesus where he's saying, by the way, you need to trust in me, love me, follow me, hear my words, obey my words, do what I say. Know that they hated me, they're going to hate you, by the way. You know, they hated me without a cause, but there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit's going to give you what to say when you are treated like I'm about to be treated. That makes sense? He's literally about to be arrested. He's saying, your time's going to come. You're not greater than the master. The servants are going to be treated in the same way. Make sense? So you're watching a crime scene investigation kind of thing. It's literally about to go down. 
But he's telling them, in the not too distant future, same thing's gonna happen to you. But guess what? The Holy Spirit's gonna speak through you. The helper's gonna help you in that time. He's gonna give you the words to say, the spirit of truth. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Well, great comfort that Jesus gives here. And why do we, why do we say such? If we think about the simplicity of his commandments, when he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches, it just keeps our lives centered. We sometimes, I used, used to sing a song called, Jesus, you're the center. You know, be my center, be my portion, be my guide, Jesus. You know, be the, the stronghold of my life. Be the wind within my sails. Be the reason that I live, Jesus. And when we think about it, he's the center of my life. I can remain in him. I can trust in him. I can focus on him and I can find my greatest strength and satisfaction in him. He's most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him. Right? He's most fruitful in me when I'm most connected to him. Make sense? You ever forgotten to add salt or sh sugar or sour cream in your bread or your cookie recipe or whatnot? And you're like, it's just missing something. And it's, the ingredients are so important. Well, think about it. This is, a, this is like not even hitting the cookie trays or the mixing bowl with the ingredients. If you're not remaining in Christ, you, know, you may even try externally to be a loving person, to be a spiritual person, to be a praying person. But if you're not in Christ, remaining in Him, He's like, He's like the mixing bowl that puts everything together and all the ingredients makes them work together. He's like the, the nourishment that makes the recipe work. He's without him. There's no, there's no fruit. So I love this simplicity, but I also like the practicality. He says, hey guys, by the way, they hate me. They hate me really bad. <laughs> They're going to treat you really bad. But just know you've been with me from the beginning and the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words to say you're going to testify of me. So, but without him, we can't do anything. But if we abide in him, we're going to bear much fruit. That's kind of the key. I don't have to have a sermon outline for you, key points to fill in. Verse five, if you just memorize verse five for the rest of your life, you're golden. Why? Because the rapture could happen any moment. But the key is I need to abide in him, abide in his love. So my joy will be made full. I want to have fruitfulness. I want you guys to, to see God and have him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So, um, verse 11 would be another good one to memorize. And that is, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. So if you remain in him, then the joy comes and the fruitfulness comes. I think all of us could agree we want joy and fruitfulness in our lives. Amen? So the only key to that is to obey His commands, remain in Him, stay connected to Him. And then the persecutions and all that. The chipped teeth, the, <laughs> the cars breaking down, the financial troubles, the discouragement from other people. It just kind of takes its proper place when you just say, well, He's preparing a place for me. He loves me. They hated him. He had troubles. I'm not exempt in this, in this body. Guess what, though? Good news is when you get a new body and you're glorified either by rapture or by your spirit moving on, you don't have to worry about the persecutions. You don't have to worry about the pains, the disappointments, because you're literally then on salary for the kingdom the rest of eternity. You're already on salary for the kingdom. That's cool. You don't have, it's not commission. It's not, you know, fee for service. It's you're on salary for Christ. He's going to reward you with different, more responsibilities as you're faithful. But the cool thing is you're already in some ways indestructible when you're more remaining in Christ because you're like my spiritual, I'm more vested spiritually than I am. I'm more heavenly minded so I can be more earthly good. It's not the other way around. Father, we thank you so much. Jesus, you make it so clear using this illustration that if we remain in you, we will bear much fruit. And if we obey your commands, then 
will show that we love you and that uh, Lord, we thank you that your power is real and tangible in our lives. Pray that you would guide us um, as we learn from your word and what you've taught us tonight. And that we would put it into practice, knowing that it's it's a process and it's a long term to remain in you. Lord, I ask that you would continue to protect us. And give us a, an understanding that as we trust you, as we remain in you, that joy is indestructible and that joy is um, what the world really seeks. They don't understand it. They hate you because they don't know you. Help us to have compassion and turn those who are worshiping the world and worshiping the devil or worshiping their, themselves or worshiping their desires. Lord, help us to turn them to you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for sending us the helper, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us the words to say when we are persecuted. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient. I pray you bless each of my friends here tonight and those who tune in later, that they may be uh, the branches that are fruitful with fruit that remains. In Jesus' name, amen.